All right, folks. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I, I see nobody's claimed to be from Tokyo because it's two o'clock in the morning there. But I'm Stephen Colby, and I'm going to be doing the presentation today uh, to answer some of your questions I know are going to come up. Uh, there will be a link to this recording of this presentation, and I will be sending slides out within uh, probably early next week. If anybody has any questions, my contact information is here on this first slide and will be also on the last slide. Today, I'm trying for the first time some using the captioning. This was suggested by somebody in the last seminar who reminded me of the possibility. And so I'm going to hopefully it will work out today and it won't distract me from the bottom of the screen there. So, all right. Uh, welcome to IDEA to IPO. Uh, Again, I'm Stephen Colby. I'm a partner at Ramon Law, which is a semi-virtual law firm, meaning we do have about 45 offices around the world, but most of our attorneys do work at home or remotely, uh, which has been really good. We've always been this way, and uh, it meant that COVID wasn't much of a bump for us, so we're very happy about that. Anyway, today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to avoid an intellectual property disaster. And my talk is going to be primarily directed at people who are starting companies, who have relatively early stage companies. And the goal of my presentation is to help you avoid making mistakes or having things go wrong. Because intellectual property is one of those things where you could put several years into a business and then find out something went wrong and all of a sudden have everything come crashing down around you, which is the last thing we want. So I am what is called a patent attorney and I am a patent prosecutor, which means I do a little bit of litigation, but most of my work involves talking with inventors and finding out what they have invented and, and having them explain it to me. It's a really fun job. It's like getting a, a personal seminar uh, for, on some great new technology. And then I have to go and write a 30 or 40 page paper on it. And that becomes a patent application, which in turn goes through the patent office over a number of years and with arguing back and forth about the scope of the patent and eventually turns into a patent. So I'm the guy who does the, typically the early writing, the original writing of the patents and then get them through the patent office. Right? I do occasionally do a little bit of litigation. I have one patent litigation case right now that is over five years old, which gives you an idea of the cost and time involved in patent litigation. COVID did slow that down probably by a year, but uh, it, it, that's a very different uh, kettle of fish, so to speak. All right, so let's talk a little bit about intellectual property today and how to avoid a disaster. So the first thing I want to point out is, let's see, we should change slides. Yay, there is a dark side to intellectual property. What you don't know can hurt you, right? And it turns out that you can't know everything. So there's always a risk, no matter what you're doing in your business, that there can be some issue with intellectual property that comes up and bites you, all right? So as you'll see, later in my talk, there's also an upside, which is going to hopefully leave leave you in a better mood by the time this presentation is over, All right? There's five key mistakes that people make regarding intellectual property. And I'm going to go over each of those right now. And hopefully by keeping in mind those mistakes and following a rule, uh, following some of the rules that I present to you today, you will avoid some costly errors and or, or some damage to your business all right so let's look at these mistakes all right this is what i call the rest in peace mistakes all right if you do one of these things wrong especially the first two it can really kill your business kill your company right and it's very sad i have cases where people come to me and say oh my gosh look at this and i said well i wish you'd come to me two years earlier right and and we could have avoided this. So the first two mistakes are ownership. And ownership is there twice because it really needs to be. There's two types of ownership that you have to worry about. The first is to make sure you own your own intellectual property. And the second is 
to make sure you don't use intellectual property that's owned by other people, right? Both of those can kill your business, right? The third mistake is waiting, waiting too long. There, in every country, there's limitations about when you can file for patents, for instance, or copyrights or trademarks, right? If you wait too long, you can lose rights very easily. In the United States, there's a little bit of a buffer, but in the rest of the world, if you use something in a public way, uh, you lose the right to claim uh, file patent applications on it. And so that's really important. The third, fourth mistake that's really common is not having a strategy, right? Uh, sometimes one can view intellectual property as a boat, um, uh, basically a hole in the water where you pour money. Uh, but if you do it right, it comes out really beautiful and you use it a lot, right? So there's a good, as I said before, there's an upside to all this, right? So not having a strategy is a good way to spend money on intellectual property without getting anything back out of it, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And the fifth thing that we're going to try to fit in today is a little bit more about understanding the patent and really what it is. No, I keep talking about patents, but I promise you, I will mention trade secrets and trademarks and copyright and a few of the other types of intellectual property today. But I am, let's face it, a patent attorney. So most of what I'm going to talk about is patents. So understanding the patent is important. People will bring this document to me or, or send me a link and say, oh my gosh, blah, 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 blah. And I'll look at what they've sent and they've misunderstood what's there. They don't understand really what the different parts of the document are about. And it's really helpful to have just a fundamental understanding of this. You know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes of explanation now could make it, I'll give you a lot of peace of mind later when you look at other people's intellectual property. All right, so let's get started. First step, owning your own IP. All right, in the United States, and again, I am a US, patent attorney, not a German patent attorney or a Japanese patent attorney or a Indian patent attorney. So what I say is a about US law, primarily. If you want questions about laws in other jurisdictions, please ask an attorney from one of those countries. Uh, also, I need to point out that the presentation I'm giving today is a general presentation and doesn't create a attorney client privilege or relationship between us right your circumstances may be quite different from what i'm describing here so if you want specific advice legal advice on your situation you should contact a patent attorney myself or somebody else who's who's licensed to practice in your jurisdiction uh, with your questions all right jumping back to this ownership in the united states originally vests in the inventors the inventors of a patent are the people who conceived of the ideas in the claims, right? So, and we'll talk a little bit later. The patent is a big, can be a big document. It has a bunch of figures. It has a, a bunch of narrative spe, uh, writing called, we call the specification. And then there's a set of claims. The ideas in the claims is what determines who the inventors are. So if we change the claims and leave the rest of it the same, we might end up changing inventorship. The ownership of a patent is has to then be assigned from the inventors to a, another entity, the, the company, right? There can be one or more inventors. I've seen dozens of inventors on a patent application, right? Which means everybody there contributed. Sometimes the invention is a product of groupthink. There could be a meeting where people are throwing back and forth ideas and an hour later you have a new plan and concept and something you've you've come up with and that's done as a group right so it's not unusual for an inventorship to be a combination of contributions from from multiple people all right in other countries there's more of an assumption that inventorship or that initial ownership is in the company so some countries in Europe, for example, have a presumption that the, an invention by the employee belongs to the company, right? So again, you, depending on where you are, you need to find out the rules in your specific country. And I have attorney, uh, IP attorneys all over the world if you need a referral to one. 
So there's an assignment process, and the assignment process is a written official document. It has to have certain wording in it. It's important that it has the correct wording. Uh, incorrect assignments have led to what we call disasters, right? And I have seen even major universities have incorrect wording in their assignment that led to a disaster, okay? So having an attorney look at your assignment agreements, if you have employees, there should be an employee agreement that has an intellectual property clause in it that says that the inventions made by the inventor that are related to the company are owned by the company. Now in the United States, this is actually a matter of state law. So there's a really big difference if you're an employee based in Florida versus if you're an employee based in California. So in California, if you're an employee that works for a trucking company and you invent a new hand glider, that's probably not the property of, no, no matter what the, the clause in the employment agreement says, that's probably not gonna be part of the trucking company's property. But in Florida, the law is different, right? There's, there's, it's much more company friendly and less employee friendly. That's just an example. So when you're, you're putting together, when you're hiring people, your employment attorney or your intellectual property attorney should go over your assignment clauses and they can vary quite a bit. People have now employees all over the world. I, I have a company that I work with that specializes in handling international employees. So a, a company based in, in California or in Nevada might have an employee in Angola, an employee in Russia and an employee in Malaysia, right? Each one of those countries has different employment laws and different requirements uh, for benefits and all kinds of, of, of things like that. So it's, it's very important as a company that you follow these rules. If you don't have the proper language in an employment agreement for the specific country that the employee is in, you can get in trouble. You can find that that agreement isn't valid. Right? So all of a sudden you have a problem. I'm talking about employees, but these assignment clauses, they also apply to founders of the company. That's probably you, right? Or your coworker or your boss, advisors, consultants, contractors, any place you can, you want to get IP clauses into the agreements. One of my favorite examples is uh, Adobe. We all use Adobe PDF and probably everybody here has also used Adobe Forms. Well, the Forms was invented by a sales guy at Adobe, not an engineer, right? He said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could do blah, blah, blah? And that turned out to be a really important product, a really important feature of the software. So everybody involved in your company, everybody who might generate intellectual property for, for your company should be executing an agreement of some sort that assigns the IP. And that agreement should be tailored towards the location where the person is working. If the employee resides in Florida or in France, you have to have an agreement that it complies with the local laws of that employee, right? So this can be vague, right? If you have an employee who spends the summers in Nevada and or summers in Canada and winters in Nevada, then you have to worry about how much time they're spending in each place. Right? It's, a, it's a big mess. Another reason to have a, a good law firm behind you uh, because of the new, all the new quirks and twists of employment law. Right? Founders are often forgotten. It's important that there's an agreement among the founders that they will assign their intellectual property to a company. And I have literally seen a company that's three and a half years old and the CTO, one of the founders says, you know, I never signed that IP agreement. And I've decided that I've put in so much to this company, I want 30% of the company, or I'm walking away and I will not sign the IP agreement. Okay, and that company had already taken about $4 million in investment and had 30 employees and it died, right? It, it, it never worked out. They never came to an agreement. So it's really important that you have all these things buttoned up. The last thing 
I want to see, or probably you want to see too, is for you to put in a couple of years of your life into some effort where you think you're going to have a great exit or do something really well or make lots of money or, or reach your goals and then find out, oh, there's this one little thing and all of a sudden you have an intellectual property disaster, right? The assignment process is kind of similar to when you buy a home, right? In the United States, in, we have recording of homes at the county level. In other words, if you buy and sell a house, the ownership of that house is recorded in efficient, official government documents at a county recorder's office. So everybody knows who owns the house and there, there shouldn't be so much, uh, so much dispute. The same things happens with, with intellectual property, both trademarks and patents. There is an assignment process that's recorded with the intellectual with the, the local patent office. So in the United States, it's the US Patent and Trademark Office. So when the assignment is executed, it then needs to be recorded at the patent office for it to be uh, enforceable, right? Because what can happen is somebody signs another assignment without regard to the first one, and all of a sudden there are two people who think they own this, these patents, which of course leads to another type of intellectual property disaster. All right, so that's it. You want to make sure you own your own IP. But is there anything else I should add to that? One one thing I want to say is sometimes people use uh, Upwork or other types of contract services. So I've done this in the past for doing things like designing logos for a company or, or uh, icons for, for web apps, for, inst for instance. And I've gone and hired somebody who's based outside the United States. In the documents, in all of the setup forms of those websites, right, those gig economy websites, there's a checkbox that says, I own all this IP. Anything produced is owned by me, right? And that, if you don't check that checkbox, you're not actually, you might get a, a nice set of graphics from the person in the Philippines or Vietnam that look wonderful and you use in your website, but you haven't gotten ownership of those. The original designer artist has the ownership. So be really careful. You have to check that checkbox because four years later, that person may come back and say, by the way, I've just sold the rights to your logo to somebody else and they'll be sending you a letter, all right? So if you use a, uh, a contracting service or a gig working service like that, be sure to look at the intellectual property uh, terms in the agreements carefully. Uh, that's a, a good rule to remember. All right, let's move on to the next type of ownership, other people's IP, all right? You kind of want to avoid treading on other people's IP because you don't want to do a lot of development in advance and then all of a sudden find out that your company name or a piece of your code or the, the text on your website belongs to somebody else. Right? There's a, a difference in motivation for startup companies versus well-established companies. So I work mostly with early stage startups. There's a few big exceptions, but from the startup viewpoint, it's really a benefit to get, have a good idea of what else is going on out there. And by, I, by that, I mean you should do your homework. Go and look at what your competitors are doing. Go and search Google patents to see what patents they may have pending or what's is, been issued. You should have a good idea of what the competitive landscape for intellectual property looks like in your, in your business when you get really first start out, because that's the best time to do it. Because at that point, you're flexible. You see somebody else's patent, you go, oh, that looks an awful lot like I want, what I wanted to do. And then you figure out, well, maybe they're going to sell the patent to you. Maybe they're actually a competitor. Or maybe you can tweak at that point. You can change your idea before having spent lots of money and, and months or years of your life on this project. You can, you can pivot and do something a little bit different to avoid their IP. You want to know that when you start. So the startup point, viewpoint for looking at intellectual property is go and read the literature, right? As a former scientist, 
you know, I was always taught you got to go spend a certain amount of time every week reading what else is going on in your field. Otherwise, you'll just get bypassed. Right. So with regard to intellectual property, a startup, I encourage you to go and look at what the competitors are doing. Now, it's different for a well-established company. If you work for Intel, they don't really want you to look at patents because once you become aware of patents, it changes the liability. All right. And uh, so if you if you work for a larger company like that, their products are set in stone. They aren't so flexible. They can't read somebody else, see some of another patent says, oh, let's redesign our, our newest flagship product because to avoid this. Right. So. Um, one of the things I see a little bit, I'm not really looking at my other screen here at the chat. If you have questions for me, I will be going through the Q&A. So if you want to chat among yourselves, please use the chat. If you have questions you'd like me to address at the end of the seminar, and I'll, I will go, try to go through as much of them as possible, please use the question and answer uh, feature. And that's where I'll, I'll be looking for questions. All right. So if you're an early stage company, do your research, read, quote unquote, read the literature, right? Um, keep good records as well. Um, this is something, again, I have a PhD in a field called analytical chemistry, which means I was an engineer who built chemical instruments, right? And I learned to write, keep lab notebooks, right? When I finished my degree, I had a big, I had a, you know, eight inches of lab notebooks, right? Uh, keep good records. And that can really help your IP in a lot of ways. Let's let's look at some examples. You have a meeting where everybody's sitting around and giving talking about ideas, and you know two or three people have a, a notebook out, a real notebook where they're writing with bound and they're writing notes, or they have a computer log that they uh, they keep electronic notes with, and uh, they write down notes about what ideas were discussed at the meetings and what's why, which ones were approved and what the next step was and all. It helps your business if you're a good note taker. Right? You should be listening and taking notes uh, when there's a meeting. It might be a note that say, Julie had this great idea to do blah, right? And four months later, that side, we you decide that that's something really important and you go back and you notice, ah, Julie was the one who invented this. We don't have a question. It wasn't Andrew, right? Andrew came up with something later, right? You'll have records about who did inv who invented what, right? Another example is, um, let's say that you have a meeting like that and you come up with a bunch of really cool ideas. You know, maybe it's individuals or a group of people, David and Andrew and Jesse, discussed this and came up with these ideas, right? And then a month later, you hire Antonio. And Antonio comes from another company. And a year later, that other company sues you for trade secret theft, accusing you of, of coming up with these ideas because you hired Antonio and he gave you all the, the secrets of your company. Well, fortunately, you have a notebook which has been documented that shows that you all had those ideas two months before you hired Antonio, right? Good, all of a sudden your notes just saved your bottom, okay? And I'm talking about, you know, traditionally we've used physical notebooks and those help. Uh, what I do is that when I have a meeting, if I write on a pad, you know, a legal pad, I, I have a scanner app in my phone and I just click, 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 and all of a sudden I've downloaded this. I email them to myself. I have a, a document repository that's secure and I, I send them there. And so I have a good legal record, right? I've been uh, involved in legal cases where, the, you know, looking back at emails 15 years ago, it's like, look, here's the email that said this and that you know, in a Yahoo email account, right? So I, I didn't tweak it or Gmail account. It shows, you know, that's evidence of what was known at a certain time. And I've seen that type of evidence make a huge difference in cases, right? Because it's, it's, it's well documented and there's a good record, especially if you have a system. So keep records. If you're going to remember one of these things, okay, from the seminar, keep track of ownership, right? Your ownership, other people's ownership and keep good records. Right? One more thing I want to talk about 
with having to do with other people's IP is the open source trap. I was just, just last week looking through documents for a merger, right? One of my firm's clients is being bought by somebody else. And part of those documentations was a complete list of all the open source software included in the company's products, right? That's a software company. And it was like a two page list of, you know, with a, the name of the open source product, the link to it, and a link to the open source license. So some or open source licenses are very company friendly. You can use something and you can use it however you want um, uh, with some minor limitations. Sometimes open source agreements say you can use this, but what you use it for has to also be made open source and released publicly. So uh, a former president of the United States, um, whose name I will not mention, uh, just fell into this trap. He had a new uh, text messaging system that he was going to release for his followers and made the mistake of using open source software. And so the company, they announced this new system that was going to be out and they got a letter from the open source organization saying, remember, you have 30 days now to release your entire source code to us because you've used our open source software. And so they had to backtrack pull it off, you know, pull, uh, cancel the release and start basically from scratch. So be careful of this. Um, if one of your engineers uses open source software, you need to make sure you know about it, that it's kept in a list, that you keep track and you have somebody review the license, right? Needless to say, you also have to have in all your employment agreements comment you know, requirements that the employees don't bring technology from their prior employers, right? The employee that says, oh, you know, I had to write the same API set for my last employer. So I'm just going to grab a few of those functions and bring them straight over because I have that on my backup hard drive. It's going to save me a week of work and I'm going to go sit on the beach instead. Well, you know, years later in some litigation, it's found out that there's actually verbatim code that came from somebody else in your software, you're in real trouble. I mean, there's huge penalties, civil um, uh, civil penalties for this. And that's the type of thing that can kill a company, right? So be aware of other people's IP. All right, let's see. What was the third thing? Ah, yes. Uh, um, waiting too long. When do you want to start? Yesterday. All right. Um, so as a patent attorney, I actually get to meet with clients really early on. Often, before, you know, they've got, they're two people and half an envelope filled out with a bunch of ideas. And the first thing they want to do is come to their patent attorney before they talk to a corporate attorney or anybody else or any investors, right? They come in and say, we have this idea, right? That's the time you want to start thinking about the IP. You want to make sure that as a group, as, as, a, as founders, you all in a green, what's going to be the IP that you're going to contribute, right, to this company. And you want to protect yourself. There's ways of establishing initial patent rights that are relatively inexpensive, you know, a couple thousand, two or three thousand dollars that will protect you when you go out and talk to investors. So you can, in a couple of weeks, have a provisional patent application, which we'll talk about in a little bit on file and that will make you a little bit more comfortable when you talk to investors and you can tell the investors hey by the way we've got we do have a, a provisional patent application filed which will at least show to them that you're on the ball and it will protect you because once you start talking to investors investors most good investors won't sign ndas and they really can't it's, it would be unreasonable to expect them to because they see, you know, a couple thousand deals a year, some of them, right? There is no way they're going to remember which, came, which ideas came from which place, right? And they often see things that look really similar. And I've been in pitch events where I think to myself, you know, I saw this two years ago and I know that company and what happened to them, right? And it's almost exactly the same business plan. So circling back 
you want to start thinking about IP right away. Okay, but particularly with the patents. When we talk about trademarks in a minute, it's not quite as urgent, but for the patents, you, you, it's great to get something on file really, really early, right? So talk to your patent attorney. Let's see. Next thing, strategy. This is my part. So uh, let me tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to digress again one more time. So I spent most of the 90s as a CTO. I was the director of product development for a scientific instrument company. And my job was everything from initial conception of the ideas, uh, you know, working with the engine, uh, doing the engineering, the electrical engineering. Uh, it was a company that had did a lot of robotics and lots of software. In the mid nineties, we had a commercial website and really, really back then we had to build a shopping cart from scratch. It was, we wouldn't, we didn't believe that people would actually enter a credit card. So we had a way where you could pr put together a purchase order and then you'd fax it to us, <laughs> right? Early internet days. So I did, I, I'm in heart a product manager. And one thing that I always really like to insist on is that patents are for the marketing and sales teams. Right. The purpose of a patent is to exclude other people from doing something. Right. You don't want your competitors to be able to have these features that are really important. The things that you want to patent should be product driven. Imagine your salesperson out there selling to a customer saying you want to buy this product or service because we are the only one that has a B and C, which are fantastic features that you can't do without. And by the way, those are the things that we have patents on, right? So it's got to be product driven. The thing that the engineer thinks is really cool, eh, okay. Um, it's it's the it's the the features that sell. It's, your patent strategy should be should take the following approach: look at the features that you think are really going to sell the product. And usually when you're an early stage startup, you, you have a bunch of points that you're pitching to investors saying, we do this and this and this, which nobody else does, which is gonna make us the, your best investment ever, right? You already have in mind features that distinguish you from the, com the competition, I hope, right? Those are what, what should drive the patent strategy. The next thing to think about is why, right? Um, you want to focus on valuation. You want to. I see people sometimes in pitch events who are pitching startups to investors say they get a question that says, well, what about the competition? And, and then the CEO says, well, we don't have to worry about the competition because we have a pat two patent applications. And that doesn't sound very good because, well, it'll probably be three or four years before those applications turns into patents. And by that point, it'll already be determined whether your company is going to be successful or not, right? And the cost of a patent litigation is in the multi-million dollars, you know, two to two to three million dollars. So if your startup turns in, into a company then, that's enforcing patents, then you become a patent enforcement entity, right? Uh, because that's going to totally consume you and it's going to consume your budget. And investors don't want to invest in patents. They want to invest in, in companies. The company has a more positive ROI, a return on investment than, than just investing in patents, right? Because it, it's so hard to inexpensive to enforce the patents, All right? So when you're doing, when you're asked by an investor, why do you have patents? You can, you say to them, it's because of, of the corporate valuation. We think that the patents are going to make our company more valuable. When they ask you about competition, your answer should be, these are the features that make our company better, and we are going to do it better, and we're going to be the first to market, and we've already shown traction, and we have the PR team, and we're going to be able to build something that instead of competing with, everybody else is going to want to buy, right? And if you do that, if you direct the value of your IP at in that way, IP becomes more than just a checkbox, right? All right, let's move on. Let's go to the next slide. 
This is the good slide. Remember I showed you Darth Vader earlier? This is time to see the light, all right? And as I was just talking about, there is a real positive side to doing IP, right? Especially for early stage startups. You are, let's see, uh, you're the little guy, okay? And this is the big one. Now the question is, hey, little guy, do you look, you look delicious, right? <laughs> um, your goal, right, if you're, your IP strategy will depend a little bit on your goal as a company. So when I first meet with people, some of the questions I ask are, what's your exit plan? And I get this strange look. Uh, and it, it matters because if you if your goal is to be purchased by Apple or Google or VMware, right, then you need to design your patent application to be valuable to those companies, right? right? The idea here is, again, valuation. Why would a, a little tiny startup with not a lot of money put thousands of dollars into development of IP portfolio? And here's to remember this line. The purpose of the IP portfolio is to increase the valuation of your company so that when you sell the company or even before you sell, when you raise money, you get a better valuation. And you can point to the IP as one of those reasons why you should be worth more, right? If I do my job right, you will get a better valuation and the IP costs will be paid for many times over, right? That is why early stage companies that want to be bought, right? We're talking about VC backed Silicon Valley type companies. Now, if you expect, to, if you're a family business, right? That could, you know, change things. I have, I have two clients that I've had for 15, over 15 years that are family companies, right? Uh, that don't ever expect to be bought by a big competitor. Um, they are doing quite well. One of them is, you know, very world, worldwide known. And the kids of the founders are stepping up and they're going to be the next generation running their company. They have a very strong patent portfolio because they have a lot of big company competitors around the world. They work in ag tech. Right? Uh, another one is just a small company that makes dog accessories. Right. And they've actually enforced patents. But um they, in the end, the second one sold the company and the IP was part of that transfer that made made their company a little bit more value, valuable. So really your timeline and when you want to exit and your strategy will impact a lot uh, about how you treat IP and what you focus on. You know, it could be that if you're a local company working in, in a specific market in a city, the trademark is more important. If you're working online and you don't really have patentable stuff, you're you're more of a marketing trademarks again might be much much more uh, interesting. Okay, so you want to develop an IP portfolio to make value, and one of the things that I do for companies is when they're doing what's called their A or B round, when they're getting their ten or or twenty million dollar investment, is I'll put together a PowerPoint slide for them showing the key thing value points of the company. Right, those those things the sales and marketing people are going to say, and then around those are bubbles with all their patent numbers and patent port applications, and then lines drawn all over it. it. Makes a big, I call it a cluster map. It's it shows the connections, visually shows the connections between the key points, advantages of the company, those things that distinguish them from their competitors, and their IP portfolio, and that's one way of making IP more than just a checkbox. It really helps represent that value, all right? Now getting started, we're gonna talk about the budget and the cost in a, in a few minutes. Let's see what time is it? Okay, we will get to that. All right, we're gonna talk about budgets and costs and how to bootstrap in just a few minutes. But let's talk, I've, I've been talking so much about patents. I wanna, <laughs> you know, it's not fair to all the other types of IP, Let's let's, see what we can get. There's more than just patents, right? There's copyright, trademarks, trade secrets, and there's some others, uh, trade dress. There are other types of intellectual property that you can get, uh, but these are the main ones that we are gonna talk about. And uh, let me just go through this a little bit to make sure you understand the difference between these. So copyright 
is something you might get on a novel or a painting or a piece of artwork, a, a logo, right? A company logo uh, could be copyrighted. Software can be copyrighted, right? The copyright protects that particular version, that particular painting. So if I have a painting of two people on a beach, it covers that painting. It doesn't cover the general idea of a painting with two people on the beach, right? And of course, you'll read about cases where the mu you know, copyright on a music, well, that music's not exactly the same, but it really sounds a lot the same. You know, there's gray areas here, right? So is it really a copy or not? Is there some variation? And there's exceptions to copyright. There's fair use, which you have to talk to an attorney about before you think you're exempt, right? Um, so copyright, if you're a software company, will cover the act, exact um, copy of your code. And copyrights, you can, they have to be, again, signed from the person who does them to the company. Your copyright exists automatically. In other words, you, do, you don't have to apply for a copyright necessarily. But to enforce a copyright, you do, right? So for key things, your, you know, a, a white paper that you use on your website or um, a cool look and feel, you know, image of what your home web page looks like, you can go to the Library of Congress and submit a copyright application. And it's real, if the fee is like 25 bucks or something last time I did it, uh, which was a while ago, but it's cheap and it's something you can do. Uh, you can copyright a whole group of pictures or once or something or, um, so you can do a copyright relatively easy. And then that means you can say that the copyright is registered. And again, all these things that we're looking at right here are country specific, right? Um, so if you get a patent, a patent is in the US or it's in France or it's in Japan or in Malaysia, right? A, a patent in France is not necessarily enforceable in Germany, right? So uh, we'll talk about foreign filing in a minute, but uh, let's see, going on, trademarks. So the copyright doesn't cover the functionality of the software. That's an important feature. If I take a program and I write it in C++, and then I write the same program in Java, right, that is not going to necessarily be covered in it by copyright, right? Because I've got different functions. I've got different language. It's, it's different. Right? Uh, trademarks. Trademarks are specifically to identify your goods or services, right? It may not necessarily be your uh, company name, right? So I'm looking at a camera right now and it says Logi on it, right? It's a Logitech uh, uh, camera and they have a little product name called L-O-G-I. And so that is a trademark that that company uses. Trademark can be very valuable. Right. In most countries, there's a first to use use idea. So if you use a trademark on, for example, your website, make sure it's associated with the product or services. Right. So the name of the product, little TM, you can put that TM now to put the world on notice that you're establishing rights in that trademark. It could be just be a word mark or it could be a nice little logo or some symbol. Right. So that trademark in most countries, once you start using it, you're starting to establish initial rights and you can then officially apply for a trademark and say, I first used it on this date. So keep track of when you first used that mark and put a little TM next to it. This is this is the easiest IP to do is go to your website where the name of the product is, put a TM by it. OK. And the little cute logo you're using, put a little TM by it. Right. That establishes initial common law trademark rights. Right. The exception is to the first to use principle is, is mainly China. There it's a first to file. Okay. So if you're getting good traction in the US and you think you're going to go to China in a couple of years, get your trademark application filed there. Applying for the trademark gives you enforceable rights. And if you get a trademark allowed in a specific country, then you can use the little circle R. That means a registered trademark. And again, it's 
geographically constrained. So if I have a registered trademark in the US and I sell my product in Canada, in theory, I should be using TM on that product. And, and a lot of time people don't bother changing the packaging, but it, it, hopefully it says registered trademark US Patent and Trademark Office, right? So that it's not telling people in Canada improperly that you have a registered trademark there, okay? So trademarks aren't so urgent. You can get initial rights right away. They're probably not the first, they're much less expensive than patents. Uh, but they're probably not the first expense that you need to do in your first nine months as a, as a company, right? You're going to figure out your products might change. The marks might change, right? All right, trade secrets is one of my favorite. I could talk for an hour on trade secrets. The one, okay, <laughs> remember this. <laughs> if you have trade secrets, the difference between a trade secret that's well-documented and one that's not is night and day. A well-documented trade secret can have real value. A one that you think is a trade secret, but you're not quite sure, not so valuable, right? So let me give you some examples. If I have a trade, an algorithm, let's say I, I've trained a neural network, right? And the training, the, 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 the factors in that neural network, I'm considering a trade secret. I document, I write two pages about it. I say, this is the training we did. These are the cofactors and the neural network. Here's the weighting functions. This is our trade secret. We're going to make sure nobody else knows about this. I take that document. I put it away in my corporate safe with my other uh, secure corporate documents. At, in, in the company, there's only three people who have access to that information. Right. And each of those people have signed a document acknowledging, yes, I know this is a trade secret. I understand that it's a trade secret and I will not uh, I will protect it forever. Right. So that's one case. The other case is, oh, it's there. Everybody has access to it. There's no paper about it. We you know, it's probably a trade secret, but we're not really sure we don't treat it that way. Um, you know, people can take copies of it and take it home when they leave our employment and go somewhere else. We're not quite sure. Maybe they still have it. Um, did we ever tell them it was a trade secret? Maybe not, right? They go to their new employer and they start using something. The That other company's defense is, you never treated this as a trade secret. You Nobody was ever told this was a trade secret. You're all now coming up with this idea that it was some sort of trade secret, but everybody knew about it. Your salespeople knew about it. That's not a trade secret. Boom. Okay. You see the contrast between the two. So I talked earlier about documenting and keeping notes, right? Trade secrets that are documented and having a quote unquote program, a binder with your 10 trade secrets in it is important. Your sales team, if they get access to your full mailing list, your whole prospect customer list, that's a trade secret probably. They need to sign off. I always feel sorry for the engineer who worked at one company and five years later is, you know, two jobs later, is at a different company. He says, you know, I solved that problem a few, five years ago. What did I do? Oh yeah, blah, 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 right? Is he going to remember that was a trade secret? I feel is that if you make somebody sit down and sign a document, and again, when they're leaving on the exit interview, they acknowledge, oh, yeah, I remember, that's a trade secret. Then they have a chance to remember, okay? So trade secrets document. Trade secrets can be really valuable, right? When you're selling your company, the very last step of due diligence, on, you know, you might have said, we have a trade secret, we have a way of doing this that's really highly efficient and fantastic, and the the acquiring company might be really interested in that. The last stage of the due diligence under NDA, you'll show them the trade secret, right? And that might add value to your your company. Meaning, let me let me rephrase that. That might add value to your pocketbook, okay? So keeping track of trade secrets, really easy to do, right? Not enough people do it, all right? So of course, patents, and we've talked a lot about patents. There's different types of patents. Um, Let's let's go over a little bit uh, here. All right, the most common types that you are likely to see are provisional patent applications. 
non-provisional patent applications. Non-provisional patent applications can turn into what are called utility patents. That's a typical patent, right? There's design applications, which can turn into design patents, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. The provisional is a stake in the ground. It's a placeholder. It does not turn into a patent, okay? It's a provisional application. Right? It's quick and easy and relatively inexpensive. This means that it's good for early stage startups. You can file a provisional application yourself. There's good books on Amazon um, that'll tell you how to do it yourself. There's one called by No Low Press called Patent Pending in 24 Hours, and it will get you a provisional patent application. Right? When I my clients do it, I work with them, right? So I will go over their invention. We'll spend an hour talking about what to patent. I'll write claims for them, and I'll give them an outline and maybe some figures and get them started so they know. And so I'll say, fill in this outline, right? And so they'll do the writing, meaning. A lot of the cost has been shifted away from my time to the client. Um, and, and then we'll do some back and forth. And that gives a, what, a better provisional application than just doing it yourself. Very often I see self-done applications. And they look like a marketing document with no technical information and nothing, nothing really valuable in terms of patenting. Right? It's all fluff. Okay? Uh, the provisional is quick and easy. I can take a university uh, a paper that's about to be published in a journal. I can take a white paper. I can do a power, I, you know, add the PowerPoint slide that you're about to give to in a presentation. Um, the provisional application has a bunch of disadvantages. It's only good for what's in on the paper, right? A full patent application is going to be 35 pages of detailed description and figures, right? So you got to see there's a big difference there between a provisional of 10 pages and something bigger. So it has less strength, it has less meat to it, all right? It only lasts one year. In that year, you have to file a non-provisional that claims benefit of the provisional, okay? And then you get credit for the provisional. If you don't do that, the provisional goes away, poof, like it never happened, right? So during your first year as a startup company, you might file four or five or more provisional applications, and then scoop those all together into one non-provisional application that claims benefit of them all. One advantage of the provisional is that if after two months your company kind of changes direction, right, goes somewhere else, you haven't spent tens of thousands of dollars on patent applications that are no longer as important, right? So for early stage company that's, that might shift or the priorities might change or it may never raise funding, a provisional application is a great way to go. You can invest in a provisional application bef while you're getting your early seed round money, right? And if you never raise the money, you haven't spent you know tons of your personal money on, on IP yet, okay? Um, let's see, what else can I say about provisionals? One year, it's a strict deadline, okay? A non-provisional application is the one that will actually evolve into enforceable rights, into a patent, right? And that can take between a year and a half to five years, maybe, in the patent office. After you submit the application, there's a back and forth, and almost always the patent office will reject things initially, and then you'll go back and you and your patent attorney, meaning more expense, We'll go back and argue with the patent office saying, no, we really, what you're saying is wrong. We're really the first to do this. It wasn't obvious. We deserve a patent. Okay. And it costs, you know, a lot more than a provisional does. Right. And then it issues into a patent that should last 20 years. Okay. You can include foreign filings. There's ways to file outside the United States. And there's something called a PCT application. That stands for Patent Cooperation Treaty. And that gives you another 18 months to decide which countries to pick. Okay. And generally, even the largest companies don't pick a lot. It's really expensive to get patents in many countries, and some of them are really pricey. There are some shortcuts. For instance, in Europe, there's one patent office that will examine your patent and decide if it's be allow your application and decide if it should be allowable or not. 
And then once it's allowed, you get a French and a Belgian and a German and an Italian patent, right? And then they charge you annual fees to keep those up. It's a, it's a, it's a, a way to spend money, okay? It's expensive. So the non provision now design applications, um, we occasionally do them. And I know people who, I, I know somebody who does work for Nike, for instance, who does a lot of design applications. It could cover the, the, the tread on the bottom of a shoe. It could cover the, the layout, the top of a shoe, uh, hubcaps with cool, that have cool looks. One of my favorite design applications is the uh, Polycom speakerphone. You're probably all, many of you, most of you are familiar with the Polycom triangular shaped phone. And I'm doing this triangular with my, <laughs> my hands below the screen that sits on conference room tables. And I, it used to be before Zoom that I'd often be telling people the, this information with one of those phones sitting there. Well, it turns out that Polycom, their initial, they were, it was founded by two electrical engineers and their initial non-provisional applications were all about duplex operations and no, noise filters, right? And there were, turned out there were lots of alternatives, ways of doing those things, but they did a design application on the shape of that phone, right? And it turned out that that, that was an enforceable, a very valuable patent for them because that cool shape sold the phone. The big round one looks a lot more bulky. It's not as, as cool looking on your conference room table. And it turned out that that design application was, was good. Now, they missed the idea of a non-provisional with a speaker in the middle and the microphones around, sorry, a speaker in the middle and the microphones, you know, on a circle around the outside. That would have been, that's what gave the phone the big sound because the speaker sound went straight up towards the ceiling, but the, but this, microphones were distributed so you could hear anybody sitting around. That's kind of what should have, an application they probably would have liked to have back early. Anyway, so those are the common types of patents. There are others, plant patents and uh, patents on semiconductor masks and, and things like that. But these are the ones that a company is most uh, likely to start with. All right, moving on. Okay, let's talk about the international part. So I mentioned so one year from your initial filing, whether that's a provisional or a non-provisional, you have the option of going into other countries. You can go directly. Um, so for example, if you're gonna to go to Taiwan, you would go directly from a US provisional into a Taiwan national app application. But there's an option called uh, uh, the PCT application, which gives you 18 or 19 more months, depending on the country, to just go into other companies. So, countries. So you end up paying, you know, roughly four to five thousand dollars, depending on how much training time there is, uh, to file a, a PCT application. And they'll do a, the World Intellectual Property Organization will do a search, or one of the patent offices will do a search. And then 18 months later, you can decide which countries you want to go, quote unquote, national in. So a typical software company, or let's say a, a, a cell phone company, a, a cell phone related app might go into um, Europe uh, because Google has big uh, data centers in Belgium, uh, the US of course, because of Apple and Google, um, and perhaps they hope that Samsung will may buy them someday. So they're gonna do South Korea, right? Um, those are expensive and it's, you know, over the life of the application, that's probably going to be 50 grand per country. Uh, um, there's foreign attorney fees to pay. There's national office fees. Fi just getting a filing fee in the European Patent Office, the initial filing fee, you know, is six to eight thousand dollars, depending on how much claims and, and so on. So it's, it's it's expensive. Hopefully, by the time you get to that point, right, it's now been 30 months since your initial filing, you have funding. Right, you have a you have investors who are putting money in, and you have a you know fifty thousand dollar a year budget for intellectual property. Right? Okay, that, hopefully that's happened by the time you start looking at at worldwide patents. It is pricey, and again, if you have a patent in the U.S. and Japan, that doesn't mean that somebody can't make the product in Malaysia. The patent gives you rights to prevent, it, let's say, for example, in the U.S. It gives me the right to prevent people from making or using or importing into the United States. 
So I can block a product made in, in Malaysia from coming into the US, right? It does cost money to do that. But I can't do anything about Malaysia selling to South Africa. And really this comes down to, you wanna own IP in the countries where the biggest markets are, right? where there's big markets where you expect to participate, right? where you wanna have a competitive advantage. You wanna own a patent in the countries where your competitors are based. So if Siemens, let's say your patent is on X-ray technology or ultrasound equipment. If Siemens is gonna be a big competitor, you wanna have uh, patents in Europe. Right, because that's where they do their manufacturing and so on. Right? Um, a lot of my clients do do IP in China. There are reasons, and we can talk individually about why to do um, IP in China. And uh, they, you know, doing two or three countries is typical, right? Depending on your application. But really, if you own the United States, you're pretty. You've you've gotten a lot of the industrial market of the, of the world. All right, moving on. Oh, I'm going to show you a slide that many patent attorneys won't won't show you. I, this is, I'm I'm now going to prepare you for this. I'm going to talk about the costs, and I'm going to give really ballpark examples, just because it's important for you to get an idea of what this all means, what it could, how much money this could 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 really cost you. Because you're starting or you're running a company, and you want to have an idea of how, how much is IP. So trademarks are relatively inexpensive few thousand dollars okay um, hopefully your company can afford that to, to hire a trademark attorney to do a proper trademark application you might get it on file for a thousand bucks depending on what the trademark office comes back with it might be another 500 another thousand by the time you're done of course there can be ones where you fight and it's much more but so let's talk about but let's talk about patents okay patent costs so this number I should probably raise a little bit. So when I do, this is what I recommend, about now, right now, $2,500. This is what I recommend for a budget for getting a provisional application on a file. And of course, this will vary with among patent attorneys, right? This includes you know, an hour to an hour and a half discussion about your inventions, me preparing claims, and then preparing an outline and maybe some drawings handing that to you and say, okay, inventors, fill this in. Let's put as much in there as you can over the next couple of weeks, and then we're gonna get it on file. And the goal there is to make sure that, because I write claims so that we make sure that, that we have enough in there to at least cover those claims. What happens sometimes is people will write about the key stuff, but then when they wanna write a, a claim, and we'll talk about what claims are in a minute, they'll be missing something in the provisional, so they won't get enough they won't have had enough stuff there. The more you put in, the better it is, right? So then we do the back and forth, and we get it on a file, and I probably spent five or six hours on that. So usually I set a budget of about $2,500. And um, so that'll get you a provisional. It's good for one year. A very rough estimate on the cost of a no, full non-provisional application in the US, about $18,000. And that can vary from 7,000 to 30, okay? I'm just trying to give you a, a number here. It depends on how good it, the patent attorney is. It depends on how thorough they are, how many pages and how many hours they work. Uh, the filing fees, you know, it's a roughly 900, 800 and $900 of filing fees to the patent office. And that's to get it on file, right? I think of buying a patent is, or getting a patent is sometimes like buying a car. You can buy a Camry and get a nice car that will last forever at a, at a good price. Or you can buy a Yugo for real cheap that really doesn't do much for you. Or you can buy a Jaguar, um, which maybe not so anymore, but used to cost a lot, but spend a lot of time in the shop. So, you know, there's a big variation in what you get for what you pay for. So, but this should be if you're doing a budget for a company, this is a number in the US that would make sense. Right? Now there's a two lines here. There's a, a red line and a pink line. And the lower line is, is, is family members because patent applications can be related to each other. So if I have a startup, we might write a patent application. Check my time. Oops. 
All right, I, I'm moving quick. This is the last slide, so I promise. Um, uh, we might write a patent application that covers the core technology, and the next application takes that document and adds 10, 15 more pages to it. So that's much less expensive because we, you know, we've already written about the main technology. Now we're going to write about an extension to that. And patents can claim priority to each other, so they can get benefits of priority dates, and you get a whole family. I've seen families with 70 applications in them, right? They're all related to each other, to some core initial filings. Right? And so the cost, and I've looked at my own clients, so the cost of getting an application on file, once you're in, at a file, you're doing lots, you know, five a year or something, it can drop to $9,000 or, 8, you know, that's over the average, okay? And after you get it on file, a few years later, really depends a lot. It could get allowed, maybe a few percent of patents get allowed right away. You could take it to appeal and spend lots of money and spend six years trying to get it out. So, the, you know, there's a huge range, but it wouldn't be surprising if you'd spent about $30,000 to get your first patent out in the US, okay, with a quality patent attorney, right? Um, so that's an idea. So. Here's one thing to remember here. If you are starting a new company and you are talking to investors and you're talking and they ask about budget, a good for a Silicon Valley type startup, a reasonable number to budget for your first year in for IP, including some trademark and patents, is probably thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars. And that's assuming you've received a half a million or a million dollars in funding. Okay. So 5% or 10% of your budget might go to IP, depending a lot on how aggressive you are and so on, right? The, a big point here is that initial two, small number for the provisional, this is a exercise, this is a business issue in cash management. You wanna control how much money you're spending on your attorneys and invest a little bit and then wait. That's the real big advantage of provisional, is not to spend the tens of thousands of dollars until you know you've had traction, you know you have investors and you're ready to fly. And then you then you can really afford to get the best quality stuff, right? Okay, that is it. And I'm gonna spend the next, how much time? Uh, 22 minutes going through um, uh, the Q&A section of the, of the document. And uh, let me just say something, I should, I want, actually, first I want to thank Rob from Idea to IPO who hosts these seminars and it's really great working with him and I thank him a lot for um, creating a great audience. Uh, I do work as a partner at Ramon and we are a semi-virtual law firm. We have offices all over the world. Some of them are smaller than others. I think we have two people in Moscow and maybe five in Germany, you know, a bunch in the UK. I mean, but we're distributed throughout Asia. Uh, in the Middle East and uh, and Europe and the United States, of course, and a little bit in South and Central America. Uh, this is my contact information. Please reach out to me if you would like a uh, a short one-page summary of what I have said. Send me an email, and I will give you a list uh, on my on those five mistakes. Uh, what to avoid with a, with a little bit of written summary. Reach out to me in email and I'll send that to you uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's it, now I'm gonna dive into uh, questions. All right, we have 27 questions. So we're starting at the top. So the first one was from Dimitri who said, could you please discuss the pros and cons, let me move this window over so I'm actually looking at you, of the provisional. I think I covered that. Um, you can do a lot of, you know, provisionals are easy. I, I have, I've done slide decks just so that, let me talk a little bit about um, what a public disclosure means. You know, we talk about using things publicly. If you present at an investor meeting where pretty much any investor can come, that's probably public. It has to be a very small group and an expectation of confidentiality. And again, that's the US law. It might be different in Europe. If you are presenting at a trade show and you have a terminal, a, a 
sorry, shows my age. You have a, a computer system and you're showing your product, the functionality of your product, but all the secret sauces in a server in Liechtenstein, that's still a public disclosure because it's the functionality that's being put on display. And that means everything that supports that is counted as public. There are exceptions. If you ask three people to go and test something for you, they sign an NDA and they give you te regular test results, right? That's not probably not a public disclosure, right? So, and that again will be countries dependent on specific on what is or is not public. So file the provisionals early, um, hopefully within a year. If you try to raise money on a business for a year, you will have done it. If not, my suggestion usually is switch, okay? Um, so next, uh, Mr. An or Ms. Anonymous says, are the same assignments also applicable applicable to video or audio for something like creating a documentary. I was a director, but I don't have all the release forms from each interviewee. Yeah, so you want to try to get all the release forms from each interviewee. Um, it, it's, it really can save you a lot of trouble. And it really depends on who the interviewees are, right? Are they a famous person? Um, you know, did you just, stop people on the road and ask questions, it can make a difference. And of course, which country you're in. It, the, the law in Pakistan may be a lot different than the UK, well, maybe not there, but you know, being Commonwealth. But yeah, there, it could be a lot different in different places. Um, Michelle asks, I have a conflict. Will there be recording the slides? Uh, yes, the, Michelle, the, we will send a, a link to the recording and slides out within the next week. And Dimitri asks, again, do you notarize notebooks when you're documenting ideas? What is a gold standard of proof? Uh, what uh, did you enter those notes? So Dimitri, I have notarized things in the past and my first patents, I have a few dozen of my own, the, a notarized document was really useful. Right? It was licensed by the university I worked for to a big chemical instrument company and made the university millions. And I did have notarized documents. Um, what I was doing then was getting lab mates or people to sign off on them. What I've done in the last 20 or so years is I have a, a, a Gmail account and that's called Steve's storage or something along those lines. And every time I have an important document, I send it there. It's kind of my electronic filing cabinet. And, you know, I do that with my tax return. I do that with important bills. I do that with Things I have a, an app on my phone uh, called Scanner Pro, which turn which lets me take a you know I can click turn the page click turn the page click, you know ten pages later I've got an, a PDF I just send right and um, so for me having that record there in the in email has helped. There have been issues with my own patents and I've you know litigations and so on, where I've shown yeah I had this idea here and here's an email in an account where I wasn't, you know, wasn't on my server, it was a, a Gmail account um, that shows this documentation. I have used uh, ProtonMail for this, which is a secure email system. And um, I have had clients who send me documents. So as a law firm, we have a document management system. Uh, there's popular systems are called world docs or iManage or something like that. And I can actually receive an email from somebody, take the document, store it, and then use the software functionality to, to quote unquote declare it as record. And it locks that document and type and date stamps it, right? So there's all kinds of ways of, of keeping these records, right? Having a good email stream. And then, um, uh, so in, in law firms, uh, years ago, there used to be something called a cron file. Every time you sent anything out, there would be triplicate copies made by this, by the admin. Um, you know, the one that went to the client, the one that went to our files, and then there would be a big stack on somebody's desk. And every once in a while, that stack would go off to a warehouse somewhere, right? And that was called the cron. And if there was ever a disaster of some sort, you could always go find, you know, it was cr cron meaning chronologically ordered. C R C H R O N, right? Um, and nowadays we do that electronically. So I have a place, if I send client an important document, I have a alternative place, I, I BCC that somewhere else, 
where it's where it's digitally filed. So that's the way of storing these records. Okay, next question. Notarizing. Okay, Anne asks just to clarify reassignments. Are there not two phases? ERS, i.e., first a beforehand general agreement to sign. And yes. Uh, any future IP which has not been filed. Yes. And then a specific assignment. So Anne is talking about with an employee. There is a, a let's say there's an assignment clause in the employment agreement. And that assignment clause is, I agree to assign and I hereby assign, blah, 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 okay? And that means that if employee leaves and disappears or something happens to them so they're not available, that can be used as the assignment. Then, in addition, the, the patent attorney is gonna send a specific assignment document with that application number saying after the provisional or non-provisional is filed or even, then we'll send a specific document to that person as well and say, please also sign this. And that's what's used for recording, right? So I uh, very often, I won't, I don't like to use a employment contract as the assignment document because that gets public, right? So um, yeah, you wanna have both. It, it's really helpful to have both. Um, so, all right. Uh, Adesh, what IP issues do I need to worry about when outsourcing some of the work to a foreign and international company? Yeah, you want to have, um, let's say you're doing a, working with a Russian or Ukrainian company uh, to do development. You want to make sure that the IP agreement in that contract is enforceable. And again, even with that IP agreement being enforceable, you want to do what Ann just talked about. For each specific application, you want to make sure that you have the rights to that application. Um, some contractors are, there can be some negotiation in this issue. Let's see what time it is. Okay, I have 13 more minutes. Um, if, a, if a company is developing software and they're using tools to build lots of different software for lots of different clients, their ability to say, oh, you have full rights to these tools is limited, right? So there's some negotiation on what the scope of, of that transfer might be. Um, but certainly if there's patentable inventions made, that should come to the company, right? Um, and again, if it's foreign, you wanna make sure that the agreement you have sticks with that uh, company. There are organizations, um, that help manage foreign employees and will do things like HR and benefits for you and make sure you comply with local company laws. I've had clients, for instance, in France. And in France, you can't fire people. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of laws that you have to, and even if you're a US company and you've hired somebody in France, they're living in France, and you think that you can treat them just like a US employee, no, um, you, can, you can run into lots of problems. So, um, yeah, have an, have an attorney look over the uh, agreement with the foreign company to make sure that it's enforceable. You know, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, I, don't, I can't imagine trying to enforce an NDA in many countries in the world. It's just like, what, right? Um, okay. Okay, so Anonymous is asking me, I'm planning to copy a feature from a competitor's app. We're writing the code ourselves. Would I run into any legal problems if we create the code ourselves? Well, by creating the code, you're probably avoiding copyright issues, especially if you make it look and feel different, right? But you should check to see what patents the competitor might have on file. And the, you know, they could have filed a patent yesterday or a month ago, and they don't publish right, necessarily right away. In the US, they don't necessarily have to publish until they actually issue, which could be years back. So there's what you, you know, quote unquote, see applications on file. Sometimes they publish. Sometimes there's, well, I'm not gonna go into why or why not, but there can be art that's on file at the patent office pending that's gonna about to be issued into a patent this summer that you won't, there's no way you can know about. So if you're copying a feature from the competitor's app, go look and search in Google Patents or have a search done to see what they're, <clears throat> hold on. Ah, coffee. <clears throat> so to see what they're doing, you know, what they, what IP they might have, right? And if you make any improvements on what they're doing, that's tar targets for your own IP, okay? If, if 
because you know they're a competitor and maybe four years from now a big company is going to buy you or them right uh you want to have some ip that trumps what they're doing so you'll look at what they're doing make improvements on it and write patents on that okay so uh moving on another anonymous at which level can patents protect tech products as a website or mobile app that's kind of a broad question. Probably 70 to 80% of the patents that I write are software. A lot of them are apps. I have been a CEO of one app company in the last 20 years. So I, my company uh, made a digital keyboard uh, that you could upload on iOS and had all kinds of cool functionality. And we had that have that pretty well patented. Okay. Um, and uh, so I do a lot of apps. Apps are fun. Uh, I like it. I've done keyboard apps, dating apps, uh, battery monitoring apps, um, uh, AR, VR apps for iPhones, fun, all, all, all kinds of good stuff. So you can protect it pretty pretty well. And, and uh, the things that are hard to do are just business methods or calculations, like calculating an app for calculating the spread on an option or a the risk on a financial investment not going to be very patentable that's going to be really tough right um, but something where you manipulate or change data or search data in a different way or produce some cool result tagging you know i have a, a client that does image tagging apps they have an image tagging app and it's actually part of samsung's um, ada compliance stuff so if you're blind you can take an Am samsung phone and basically on the phone you you swing it in front of you and it describes the what it's seen in the picture like in real time um you know you can be on the beach and it's going to be boy sitting on the beach two people walking uh, on the beach person changing their wetsuit i mean uh, pretty cool technology so that's an example of apps that that we do a lot of stuff on okay moving on we now have 41 questions i'm running i'm not going fast enough. What is the difference between dependent and independent claims? How do these claims are related to, oh, I didn't talk about patent details. Uh, um, next seminar. <laughs> uh, so a independent claim is a claim uh, that doesn't depend on any others, right? It's got a certain number of limitations. The fewer the limitations, the broader the claim. A claim that goes on for a page and a half on a patent is very narrow. Right. You have to uh, remember that to infringe a claim, you have to do every feature that's limited, that's listed in the claim. And that means a claim that has 50 features in it. To avoid that claim, you just have to miss one of them. OK, a claim that oh, it's not like two or three lines long can be very, you know, could be really broad. Right. Unless the wording is specific. So. Independent claims are broader. A dependent claim will depend on the independent. And it says everything that was all the limitations of the independent claim plus these added ones, right? So that narrows the scope of the claim. It makes it more likely that the claim is valid, but it makes it uh, nar narrows the scope of it. So it makes less likely that something would infringe that claim. That's the difference. So normally a patent has a few independent, one or more independent claims, and then a bunch of dependent claims that depend therefrom. Okay, Sally asks, do you have a format or example you could share? So, um, yes, Sally, you wanted to, uh, you're asking about the slide that shows the value of how to illustrate uh, the value of an IP. And I call that a cluster map. Uh, it wasn't my idea. The idea came um, uh, from a, a patent attorney named John Farrell, who at the firm I first worked for, and I got to give him credit because I love it. And my clients and investors love it. And Sally, if you send me an email, I'll send you that. Um, somebody's saying protecting video company makes. So I assume you're asking about protecting videos and that would be a copyright. And it depends on which country you're located in, but the copyright process is relatively simple. Again, contact me and I'll, get, I'll send you to a copyright attorney. Uh, somebody asked me a question here, NFT question mark. I assume they're talking about non-fungible tokens. Um, I have two clients right now that are dealing on this subject 
And what they're doing is really a lot different than what you see out there right now. Um, but yes, we are writing patents on not just the, not the token itself, but the, how you would use a token in a new or different way that people haven't done yet, or some other bells and whistles that I can't talk about. But just like in machine learning and AI, it's very, very rare. I've done it. But it's very rare that we actually write a patent on the machine learning algorithm itself. Those are pretty are so well known and there's really good ones out there. Usually what we're writing patents on on an AI application related application is, you know, how the let's say it has to do with pay, uh, medical care, how the system is trained, how we get good training data, how we have a feedback mechanism that improves it, how the doctor interfaces with it, those the the machine the machine learning uh, the neural network itself is not something we put the patent on. It's all the interactions and the way that thing works. Okay, um, so a copyright apply to a design. It can um, you can co yes. So if I had a but you should sit down. Uh, and so the, uh, Luke is asking if I have a piece of furniture. Can I copyright the, the style of furniture? Yes, um, it can. And so uh, that's a detailed question because you're going to be touching on possible trade. It could be a trademark. It could be um, a design application. Um, or you could take a, a design like on the back of a chair and you could copyright the, that, that nice rose carving. Right. So there's all, there's a bunch of ways that, that can be covered. And that's a detailed discussion but yes definitely could be covered do shorter claims give an inventor broader uh, arthur is asking this is do shorter claims give an inventor broader protection and i have three more minutes sorry folks um yes this is a pet peeve of mine somebody will come to me and say i just got this patent and i want to enforce it against everybody and they give me a patent and they got it they said you know i didn't pay for one of your expensive my patent attorney got this out and it only cost me five thousand dollars right and the patent itself is like six pages and then there's a claim that runs a one claim that runs a page and a half that lists and the, the the guy coming to me says it's got everything i do in there it's fantastic it covers everything and he misses the point that in order to infringe that claim somebody would have to do everything he did Every little item in that giant claim would have to be done for it to infringe. And all they need to say is, oh, we don't do that. And boom, they don't infringe the claim, all right? So a claim with fewer limitations is much broader than one with lots. Now, when you enforce a claim, it could be challenged either that it doesn't cover the product, right? Or, you know, in other words, it's too narrow, or that it it's not a valid claim. There's there's prior art that anticipated and shouldn't have been issued. So you want to have a mixture of claims in your patent. You want a couple of nice broad ones, and you want um, a dependence or some some examples of narrow claims that cover the key some key features. Right? It's important to pick the right things to to have the narrow claims on things that they might be narrow, but you really can't do without. Okay? So and that's an art. That's a, they your patent attorney should be working with you, trying to figure out how your system works and what's what's critical and fundamental, what can be a broad claim and what could be a valuable narrow claim. And you also want to patent things from what I call orthogonal directions, and it's a math term, but it means from different directions. So if I had the sewing machine, right, I might patent the bobbin, which is how you get the thread looping, uh, and the trendle that you would put your foot on to get the thing to move. But I might also patent the needle with a hole at the pointed end. That's a sounds really simple, but before the sewing machine, you would always put the hole at the fat end of a needle, right? I mean, no, nobody would put it at the pointed end. It was non-obvious, okay? A, a silly way to do it. But but it, it would be a great patent, right? It would still own <laughs> sewing machines. So, so you want to patent your product from a bunch of different directions. And when you sell your company, you want to have, you know, a dozen patents or patent point, you know, some that cover different aspects of what makes you important because some of those may fail right there might you might learn later that somebody filed a month before you and one tack one thing you thought was unique isn't so you want to have an array of patents 
or, or even in a patent array of claims that, that look at the invention from different directions. Okay, moving on quickly. Can I trademark the same word, i.e. cigars? Okay. Um, Dimitri's interesting question. Can I trademark the same word, e.g. cigars with an S, if, I, if it was used before to trademark e.g. E diapers? Clearly different products with no name. Yes, you can have the same name for different products in different categories and different classifications for a trademark, unless it's what's called a famous mark. So you can't use Rolex for diapers, even though it's not a watch, right? Because Rolex, they own Rolex for anything, right? Or Nike, okay, those are famous marks. And the, the issue with trademarks is, is there gonna be, okay, I'm over time. Is there going to be um, patent, you know, confusion in the marketplace? So pretty much anything that says Rolex is associated with, a, you know, a Swiss Army knife or you know, a Nike. Or, um, uh, but yeah, you can have a, a woman's handbag and a um, a car with the same name. All right, that's not a problem. Okay, uh, and again, a trademark attorney will hand you on a case by case basis. Okay, Sally asks, can you talk a bit about how to assess the market value of a patent? Um, uh, uh, the value of a patent, I, I have, a, it, it's like your, your partner, your spouse. It's in the eyes of the beholder, okay? Um, it really depends on who, whether it's being infringed, whether there's a business potential. There's so many factors. I know people who will value give values and if somebody wants a referral like that i can uh, refer to somebody who will do look at a patent portfolio and do a valuation of it but it's so much in the eyes of a beholder and so when a startup fails usually the patents just go away right the, um and again it's like you know the person who might be attractive to you is not you know is going to be very different than the person who's you know for somebody else so it's it's really a, a business Patents are most valuable when there's a business patent fit, right? And they're adding to the value of a business, right? That's why uh, investors want to invest in businesses, not in IP usually. Okay, next question. Ben, who owns the copyright for a produced video when the contents was created by multiple people? For example, a camera operator recorded some, you know, multiple operators, different people. Yeah, so different people could own the copyright of different parts of that video, okay? Um, you and no paper was signed by either. So, and also it could be, you know, a camera operator who's being directed, right? I would, we, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna state an opinion on this, but in some places it may be assumed that everything's being done under the director, but this might be a country by country or state by state law. You would need to, and we, you know, my firm, we do a lot of work in Hollywood so we could answer that question for you. I have people who can who work in the industry, but um, yeah, this is a case where this is a good example of making sure you have some sort of agreement out up front. Okay, um, sends Flix Inks asking about trademarks. If I use a new word and want to trademark, can I start using trademark superscript even before I apply for the trademark? Yes, you can use the TM right away. You need to apply and have a, a trademark actually registered issued before you can use the circle r you can also use sm for a service mark right? um, yes so if you're doing a trademark application yourself and just paying the, the fee for one class the wording of the trademark description can be really critical and you want to make sure that you have that right the mistakes that people make when they do a uh, trademark by themselves is they, is they don't get that wording quite right, right? And then it turns out that it, it doesn't represent the right scope. Anyway, well, okay. As somebody's asking, are trade secrets available for services, businesses? Sure. Um, how you schedule people, your customer list, um, the cleaner, <laughs> the special soap combination you use in your pressure washer when you clean graffiti, whatever, I don't know what your service business is, but, but uh, yes, definitely there can be uh, trade secrets. Uh, Daniel asks, can we have a combination of patent and trade secret? For example, can we exclude certain information in the patent if it's not obvious? 
Yes, but there are caveats. You have to talk to your patent attorney about this. You have to explain enough in the patent so that somebody of the ordinary art can do it. So let's say you're doing a patent on the Star Trek transporter. You can't leave out the part where they go from little sparklies and then show up on the planet as new little sparklies, right? That, that critical piece of how it works, you have to explain in the patent enough so that somebody can do it. It could be that you say, when then we use a neural network and we train it, but you've got a trade secret on exactly how you've trained your neural network and you've used a neural, uh, a neural network, you didn't specify what kind of neural network you had in the system, for instance. That could be the trade secret part. So, all right, I'm going to, I have lots of questions um, still. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, well, I'm already six minutes over. Please send me an email. I'm going to move this out of the way. Oh, wait, you uh, yeah, you, you guys should see my screen with my, my email on it. Reach out to me. And if anybody sends me an email, I will send them a one page um, by the middle of the month. I will send them a one page description that kind of summarizes some of the things I've said to here uh, today. And thank you very much. Uh, and thank you again, Rob. I will be doing another seminar with a slightly different bent uh, next month. All right. Have a good day.